On the overhead, you'll see we're going to be in three different places, maybe in more than that, but these are three places that you can begin to find in your Bible. In uh, Galatians, we're looking in chapter 4, and then also we'll be in Luke chapter 2. And then Hosea, that may be the tricky one. I'll give you some time finding Hosea chapter 10. Here's a hint, it's in the Old Testament. <laughs> what we're talking about, and, and some of the songs have, have indicated that, and, and the scripture that, that Matt shared, we're talking about preparation. And I got to thinking a lot about preparation yesterday, and, and I think a lot of us have been thinking about it. Winter's upon us. I hope you realize that. It's, it's, it's come upon us again. It comes whether you want it to or not. And the thing about winter is, if you're not prepared for it, you're going to be in trouble. And I think a lot of people have already prepared. Wood has been chopped. Hay has been bought. Tires have been replaced. A lot of things that we've got to do on the front end around here to prepare for winter. So we've got to take that seriously. You know, thinking about today, everybody who is here today, because I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure I'm probably about the only one that walked and my kids. So everybody else drove. So thinking about this today, you prepared to come here and you may not have even realized it because I believe you probably went out to your cars and you started them up and there was gas in them. So there's that idea our whole lives, when you really think about it, when you step back, so much of our lives deal with preparation. Things that are are needing to be done so that other things can happen. You think about it, and I always, I'm always reminded of this. Insurance is a great example of preparation. I thought about Tammy's place yesterday. And I'm sure she had insurance, but even what we were dealing with in trying to get her home prepared for the winter time so that the cold air is not going to go up underneath and go through her, her floor. All of these things, you know, we're in this mode so often of preparation. Christmas time. We buy gifts early, don't we? Most of us do. My wife would probably think I don't buy gifts early, and sometimes maybe I don't, but a lot of times we buy gifts early to give to people as preparation in building up for that. So this is a big part of our lives. So in light of the Advent season, and as I shared last week, we dealt with hope. Today we're dealing with with preparation, and we're going to look at two sort of three different phases of, of preparation in light of Jesus Christ. I want to look at it in uh, light of Christ concerning preparation of time, concerning preparation of earth, and I'll explain what that means when we get to it, but also the preparation of man, of individuals for Christ. So again, we'll be in Galatians, Luke, and Hosea. So let's pray together, and then we'll, we'll see how the Lord directs us today through His message. Father, again, thank You. Thank You for allowing us all to be here today, Lord. What a blessing to be able to come into Your house, to worship You, to to sing songs of praise, Lord, to have songs played for us, Lord, as an offering up to You that truly take our attention and our affections to the Lord Jesus. And this is a special time of the year where we remember, God, when You became flesh, Jesus, when You dwelt among us and lived among us, what a special time. We think about that baby in a manger, yes, but we also know, Jesus, that You grew and You grew up and lived a sinless life but then took our place on the cross, taking all of our sins upon Your head. You did that. You died for us. You were buried, raised from the dead. So Lord, please allow us that as we focus a lot on this first Advent, on the Advent season, to remember the second Advent, to look at it with hope and promise and preparation of Your return, Lord. Give us that this throughout this season, but every day of our lives to be expected of Your imminent return. And so, Holy Spirit, guide us in in all that we do today and all the scriptures that we look at. Please minister to our hearts. Speak to us. Speak to me. Communicate truth to us. Challenge us. Change us. We want to have an encounter with you today. And we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in Galatians chapter 4, looking in, these are going to be some familiar verses, um, no doubt. But beginning at these verses, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, I want to deal, again, preparation in relation to Jesus Christ in time. So let me read these verses, Galatians chapter 4. And it starts off, and it's dealing with the context of something that we hit on last week from Romans, of of being heirs, being adopted. But listen to this scripture, and again, this this won't be new to, to many of you, but scripture writes, in Paul's writing, he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So thinking about this this preparation in light of Christ concerning time. Timing really means everything, doesn't it? I mean, there are so many things that happen, so many events in your day where if, if timing was off or delayed or increased in such small amounts, big changes could happen. I was thinking about this on our ride back from Franklin on Friday night, coming over through those mountains. We immediately came on a vehicle that was in a ditch. We came upon another place where one a wreck had been cleaned up. And as we're coming around a curve, there's a guy coming way too fast, and he actually came over in the yellow line, and I swerved because, I mean, we were close to a head-on collision. And I just realized, timing is everything. Had we been... 30 seconds, or maybe not even, have we been 10 seconds faster, we may have hit him. Or have we been slower, he may have actually gone all the way in the lane. All of these things, and it just reminded me, wow, timing truly can mean everything. But there's a song that Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote in the 80s, and, and it's called Lord of the Dance. If you don't know that song, it's, it's a fabulous song, beautiful song. Um, if you're a guitar person, I mean, it's just a great, great song. But there's a line in it that I love. That he says, he gives purpose to chance. Think about that. There are so many things in our culture that are dealing with chance. You've seen it. You know, when the mega lotto or whatever that thing is called, and and people flock to it, and and they're, they're, they're laying down their money for what? A chance. That's all it is. And the, the, it's astronomical to, to the, the possibility of them winning, but, but it's all about a chance. But here's the thing. Christian, we are to live our lives. And this has to be a challenge because this is truly countercultural. We are to live our lives not under the illusion of chance. Because truly, chance really is an illusion. It really doesn't exist. But we are to live by the surety of providence. We have a God and we say it. And, and Matt, I was thinking about you in, in talking about your job and the prayer and the time that you guys were not having that and, and being patient. We talked about it and we said it a lot. God has this under control. Amen. We say that a lot. But I want you to think about what that means. That doesn't just mean that God is sitting up there in heaven and has knowledge of the things that unfold and just allows it to happen. I mean, God is unfolding things in accordance to His perfect will and plan that we don't get to see all the big picture of it, but we know that it's happening, that it's true, that there is a rock solidness to that, to standing within the providence of God because He truly does have these things. We sing that song, and it's funny, our kids sing it. He's got the whole world in His hands. You know, that may be a simple song and a lot of kids do sing it, but you realize what that really means. That does give purpose to chance. Think about God becoming flesh. This wasn't just some arbitrary moment in time. It wasn't as if God was looking over the the corridors of time and then just kind of went, oh, okay, we'll do it on this day. This seems like a good time to send forth the Son. It wasn't like that. It wasn't on a whim. He didn't just one day say, oh, hey, yeah, Jesus, go ahead, go. You know, go down there and, and, and live your life and be born of a virgin. The time was full. Listen back to our scripture. When the fullness of time had come. Not at an arbitrary moment in time. Not at just a random moment in time. But when the fullness of time had come. When history was ripe for the Savior to come. Why did He come when He came? Think about that. How many years had the world existed Had mankind existed before Jesus came? There's a debate on that, but thousands of years. But then at that moment, Jesus came. Why didn't He come later? Because the fullness of time had come. The time in which the Father had preset this. Jump back to a couple verses. I didn't read these in Galatians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. I think this kind of gives us some insight into into what's being said in in verses 4-7. through Paul says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set 
by His Father. See, I think that's kind of the key that sort of unlocks the fullness of time. A date set by His Father. When Jesus Christ came, God the Father, He knows everything. He sees everything in a moment. He knows history. He knows governments. All of these things laid out. But it was at the fullness of time, at that time of a date set by the Father, that the Son was sent forth. The Son was told to go. And not just live a sinless sinless life. Yes, that was it. But go get your bride, son. Go do this. And then come home and prepare a place for her. And that's where the second advent, that's where the return of Christ ties in for us as believers. Because it's one thing to look, yes, He came, and He was a baby born in a manger, and He lived a sinless life, and He died on the cross for our sins, raised from the dead. That's the gospel truth. But He's coming back again. And we've got to look forward to that as we go through this Christmas season. And it's, again, this is the challenge. You know, we're going to be bombarded with Christmas in, in, in the presence right now. But we've got to think about His return. We've got to let that translate into hope and rejoicing and preparation that He's coming back. That He's coming back soon. And we want our hearts to be rejoicing and glad for that future event. That isn't far off, folks. Again, I'm not putting a date on it. The Son doesn't know yet when the Father will send Him, but it will happen. And it's going to happen sooner than it's ever happened in history past. Because every moment that doesn't pass when Christ comes back, it's one moment closer to His return. So we want to have our hearts ready for that. Which ties me into the second part. I want us to look now. Turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read a portion of, I guess, what you would, what would be considered the, the Christmas story. But we saw preparation concerning time, but now I want it to see preparation concerning earth. And what I mean by earth, I want to, I want to kind of flesh this out a little bit, because I don't mean like the physical earth. I mean, especially, and we'll see it as we read this, a localized, or the localized affairs of rulers and governments that absolutely forced prophecy to be fulfilled. That's a mouthful of words there, but what I mean is things were happening on a local level through rulers who were not followers of God, but in that bottleneck came forth prophecy that had to be fulfilled concerning the Christ. So, look in Luke chapter 2, and beginning in verse 1. And again, this is a familiar, familiar Christmas text. It's beautiful, but I want us to see it in the form of preparation. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration where Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, we we saw a cool illustration of that. That was fun, watching those kids and, and just hearing their story. But they got the gist of it. They got the meat of what took place during that time. But I want you to step back now and think about all of this. Don't just Don't just... Pass over it because you've heard it every year and, and constantly the, the Christmas story. But I want you to think about this. First off, they're in Nazareth. That was where Joseph was from. And roughly, they say it's about 90 miles from Bethlehem. But, but I want you to, to consider this. Number one, they would have either both been walking or there would have been a donkey to bring forth, some people think, firewood. And then Mary maybe would have rode on that. So possibly you're dealing with four days travel, give or take. But I want you to not forget this. She was pregnant. Fully pregnant. Now ladies, you who have carried children to full term, how does that feel? How many of you want to go on a 90 mile hike fully pregnant? Raise your hand. (laughs) Oh, that was to the ladies? (laughs) No, if you were fully pregnant. (laughs) Think about that. Think about that for a minute. She walked fully pregnant. And don't think, you know, we get no indication from Scripture that Jesus uh, was a preemie. Nothing like that happened. A full, and we'll use the 90 mile walk, fully pregnant, 
full term, all of these things. I want you to imagine this, and you can understand this. Anything could have happened on that journey concerning her giving birth. It's funny, this last week, last week, we celebrated Evan's seventh birthday. And we, we, reminded, we were reminded and rejoiced of the day he was born. Because you guys know that in the human experience, births can happen anytime. Unplanned. You can plan it all out. You can, you can pack your bags. You can do all that stuff. But when that baby's coming, that baby's coming. And you really don't have much of a say in it. And that was with Evan's birth. It was a fun day. We were, I was pastoring down in Florida. And it was a special day. I was calling it Ordinance Sunday. Because we were baptizing two new believers. And then later we were partaking in the Lord's Supper. So it was a really cool, fun day. I was real excited about it. But that morning, Sarah, and, and all of her pregnancies were somewhat high risk. They had to be C-section and things. So there was a level of preparation that we had to be very careful about. Well, that morning, she felt like something was going on. So she called the doctor and said, I think something's going on. And he said, ah, don't worry about it. He said, oh, you're fine. What did he say? When to come in? It was like, come in next week or something. Everything's fine. And I remember myself, there was a road between our house and the church. And I'm out there pacing it back and forth because I know something's going on. She's concerned. She knows her body. All of these things. But the doctor, you know, he reassured us. He said, everything's fine. No problem. Don't come in. So we went to church, went through the baptism, and the way that it was set up, I would sit in the front, Sarah would sit in the back, and and we kind of had a praise and worship team. And so as the service is going on, I'm real excited, I'm in the front, you know, I'm kind of got my eyes closed, and I'm just, you know, worshiping, just really enjoying the Lord that day. And I don't recognize that there's a commotion going on behind me several rows. I, you know, I was, was in the Lord. I wasn't worried about what was happening behind me. Well, I come out of it and I open my eyes and, and the women that are leading going, and I was like, what? And they said, you got to go, Sarah. And I turn around and Sarah's gone. Come to find out that while she was back there worshiping, something happened. Third row, not in the back. Oh, oh, sorry. Third row. You were behind me, but her water broke. And this was a dangerous thing because it had to be a C-section. So for us, we were 45 minutes from the hospital. So I'm there and I don't know what's going on. They finally take note. You know, I, I notice it. And they're like, you got to go. And I run in the back to the bathroom. And it's kind of a chaotic situation. They get her to the car. I run back in the sanctuary. I don't know who watched our, our little kid. You know, we have Rachel and Ella. I don't know who watched them. Oh, yeah, Miriam too. That's right. She was a baby herself. So... All of these things are, are happening. The one guy who, who I knew I could count on to preach, he said, I think they're going to have a baby. And I said, we are having a baby. I said, preach. And I ran out of there. And we got down there. And, and I'm not a fast driver. Most of you know that. But boy, I was lighting it up that day. And we got to the coast of Florida, which I've never been there on a Sunday, but never hit traffic. And it was bumper to bumper traffic over top of the intercoastal waterway, all of these things. But we got there. But I'm reminded that births come no matter how well you think you've got it planned and how well things are going to work out. So I want you to to let that transfer now and translate into Mary. You know, she was moving 90 miles on her feet or more comfortably riding on a donkey. (laughs) That's not the most comfortable way to travel either. Anything could have happened at any moment to where she could have given birth if it was left to chance. And it wasn't. There was an aspect of preparation there. And you don't need to turn there unless you're real fast. But Matthew chapter 2, which is actually a quote from Micah chapter 5 verse 2 of the Old Testament. But Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 talks about, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came... Why, I'm sorry, I turned too far. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him and assembled, assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, and here's, here's Micah chapter 5 verse 2, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler 
who will shepherd my people Israel. Now think on that. For us, we kind of take for granted that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But He was not from Bethlehem. Joseph did not live in Bethlehem. They traveled 90 miles into Bethlehem. And again, anything could have happened on that journey, but it didn't. Because prophecy had to be fulfilled that out of Bethlehem would come the Savior, would come the Christ, even to the point where Herod, who by all accounts was a horrible heathen, had to figure out, wait a minute, where's the Christ being born? Because there's rumors that there's another king out there. And he was a very, very paranoid man. And they looked back into the Scriptures and realized He had to be born in Bethlehem. Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. That aspect of preparation, again, it wasn't left to chance. And then they go and there's no room at the end. We saw the story. You know the story. But they placed Him in a feeding trough. Now this is one that I have to step back to. Think about this. What's a feeding trough? It's a glorified food bowl for animals. That's what it is. I want you to think about this. And please be honest. Who would place your newborn baby in a food bowl? Anybody? Think about that. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't think of doing that. But here's the most amazing thing. That food trough, that dirty container, because you know how sloppy it is when animals eat, that became the throne of the Lord of all creation. Not because that thing was holy, but because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as a baby, was placed in in that. Even that preparation, that aspect of it, equates to something much bigger. And this goes into our last preparation aspect. And that's the preparation of man. The preparation of an individual heart. So you can turn to Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. And again, this isn't your typical verse on preparation, but, but in a way I think it kind of is. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 says, So for yourselves righteousness... Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord that He may come and rain righteousness upon you. I want you to think about this. For lack of a better term, as nasty as a feeding trough would be, is it more nasty than a human heart? Is it more nasty than the core of man? Listen to what Jeremiah said about the heart. It is deceitful above all things, And desperately sick. That's the human heart. That's the core of who we are as, as human beings because we have a sin nature. And that nature wants to desperately rebel against God. Even when we have the knowledge of God, we still have that nature within us that wants to drive us in a completely different direction than Him. But think about that. Think about what happens. As the baby Jesus was laid in that feeding trough and that feeding trough became His throne, who would place a holy God, into a deceitful and desperately sick heart. But that's exactly what happens when we come to faith in Christ. When we recognize the fact that we are sinners and that He is holy and there is no chance at all in ourselves or in the world to be good enough to earn heaven, we've got to humble ourselves and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and open up the core of who we are And invite Him in. Bring Him in. Embrace Him in the midst of who we are. Now think about that. Back to this verse in Hosea. Sow for yourselves righteousness. See, up to the point of coming to faith in Christ, what are we sowing? The flesh. Deeds of the flesh. Things that are unrighteous. Selfishness. That's what we're planning. And that's what we're going to reap. But when we sow for ourselves righteousness, we will reap steadfast love. When we sow for ourselves a righteousness not found in yourself, please understand that. This righteousness doesn't mean you being good enough. What it means is you recognizing that you are bad enough to trust in one who is perfect enough to take your place. That's what that really means. So sow for yourself righteousness, reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, that uncultivated soil. Break it up. Break your heart up. You've all done this. You've all planted gardens. You understand it doesn't do you any good to go onto a plot of ground that's not been broken up and throw seeds on it. You're probably not going to get a good harvest. But what do we do? We till it. Sometimes we till it several times. We break up that uncultivated soil so that when we plant a seed, what will it do? What's the purpose? To bear fruit. 
And so here's the preparation that has to take place in a man's heart. We've got to have that fallow ground, that uncultivated soil, which is our heart, which we've already determined is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. We've got to have that broken up. Now again, this isn't talking about you making yourself perfect to receive Christ. But what it is, is acknowledging that my heart is uncultivated, God, and you've got to break it up. You've got to split it wide open so that the truth of Jesus Christ, the true full understanding of Advent, of Christmas, can come into my heart and bear fruit so that I can recognize value in Christ and what He did for me on the cross and understand that in God that You planted in my heart that it bear fruit a hundredfold, that it bear the fruit of salvation. Because this Scripture continues and says, For it is the time to seek the Lord. Now is the time, today, right now, at this moment, in this heartbeat, with this breath, is the time to seek the Lord. Don't wait. Don't think, well, I'll go home, I'll meditate on this, and and then I'll seek the Lord. Do it now. We already determined timing is everything. You may not make it home. And I'm not saying that to be ugly or callous. But we're not guaranteed time. We're not guaranteed another breath. Now is the time. For it is time to seek the Lord that He may come. Him, come. Not you, make yourself perfect. But Him come and rain righteousness upon you. It's His righteousness. It's not yours. It's His perfection. It's not yours. And when we come to faith and we we trust in what He's done on the cross for us, that He died for our sins, He gives us His righteousness. What a trade-off. And then that horrible, deceitful, desperately sick heart, what does that become? The throne of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's enthroned in the core of who we are. So I want us to think about that. Think about how God prepared time perfectly for the birth of Christ. Think about how things and governments were in perfect place for Mary to to give birth to Jesus in Bethlehem. But in all of those things, if you can see those things unfold, understand that at the same time, He can do such a preparation in your heart to receive Christ, to make this the most glorious Christmas that you've ever spent, to be ready for that second advent. That second time that He's coming back, which won't be far off. So that's the challenge for us. Sinner, is your heart prepared? It needs to be prepared. And for us who are Christians, let's keep our hearts prepared for the Lord Jesus during this Christmas season. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is that has commercialized the birth of Christ or the celebration of the birth of Christ. We recognize that. We're in the world. But in Christ, we're not part of it anymore. We've been adopted. There's an inheritance waiting for us. We understand that. But yet still, we have to live out our time in the midst of this. But we have Your Holy Spirit that we cry out to You, Abba, Father. And I do pray, Holy Spirit, in my life and in everybody's life here who is in Christ that You keep our focus, that our hearts be prepared, that we would truly have, in the core of who we are, a place we're prepared for the Lord Jesus. We've seen Your activity through time, through governments, through all of these things, God, that You prepared for Your Son. And so we want our hearts. We, if our hearts have grown hard, and that happens, break up that fallow ground. Break up that, that hardened soil. So that anew and afresh we can receive the truth of Christ. But Father, I do pray in the name of Jesus if there is anybody who's hearing this, who doesn't have Christ, therefore they do not have Your Spirit. Their hearts are hard. Harder than any surface on the earth. But You have the power to break that up. Your Spirit has the power to convict us, to open our eyes. You, Father, who made light shine out of darkness from nothing, You must shine in our hearts. Showing us value in Christ. Showing that we are truly sinners and will be forever separated from You unless we come to faith in the Lord Jesus. So I pray this Christmas for those who need Christ that they would truly receive the greatest gift ever given. The whole purpose of the season. It's not just baby in a manger, in a feeding trough. It is that baby grew up and took our place on the cross and lives forevermore. Make that truth a reality for everyone, Lord, this season. 
And we ask it all in His name. Amen.